All right, great. Uh, wonderful to be here, the, especially here at DBS, because uh, the talk that you just saw that I gave at uh, TED in 2010, it, um, the picture um, I showed in, in the start of my talk was that there were uh, 3,600 applicants for my son just to get into first grade, you know, which was uh, the challenge that he was facing. And that challenge that he faced was getting into DBS. <laughs> and uh, we had some uh, guests over for Chinese New Year, and I heard that as of this year, it's at 450, 450 to one, just to get into first grade. And because of that, um, that and that, that my son uh, is uh, at this school, I, again, really grateful to have the opportunity to present, I thought I'd continue on that theme, edu innovation, education, and end game, you know, which relates to this topic of the difficulty that we have coming into these schools, um, which is the education part, the need that we have to innovate. I think Michael just talked about the, the needs and challenges for innovating. And the other thing I'd like to talk about, which is uh, related to this too, is end game. And I'm going to get to that in a second. Now to first start, can I get the, the house lights up a little bit? I'd like to challenge you by asking a question. I'd challenge you to name one invention, one technology developed in Asia over the last 300 years that have made a global impact. So if you think of the last 300 years, there's been the industrial revolution, the development of the trains, automobiles, airplanes, the internet, media, radio, television, all of these things that have made a global impact. Name one of the inventions over the last 300 years that has made a global impact. Anyone? I can't see very well, so just shout it out. Anyone? Emoji. Okay, the emoji, you know, related, well, it's being used, um, but, uh, <laughs> well, if, if you look at iconic communication, you know, our picked, you could say that the Egyptians or the, the Babylonians were the first ones that developed written language, I suppose, but then using symbols to communicate, let's see, was that, for emoji guy, where was that invented, do you think? Well, but, but actually, if you look, you know, back when, back in the day for me, um, they had been doing smiley faces, you know, colon, parentheses is a smiley face. Yeah, and so emojis are just derivative of that, and that was developed arguably when computers were first developed and computer text was developed. Now, Asia, we're good at making things smaller and cheaper, right? But in terms of new innovations, and what I mean by that is that if you think of the airplane, who do you think of? Huh? The Wright brothers. So if you think of Asia, that's like two guys, they were bicycle mechanics, and then they came up with the idea of making the airplane. Now if we look at Asia, and if you add China and India together, that's like two billion people there, right? Now if you add Indonesia, Malaysia, and the rest of Asia, you're talking about over half the world's population. What have they been doing for the last 300 years? And if the 21st century is supposed to be the Asian century, how is Asia going to lead? Now, it isn't always like this. If you look 5,000 years ago, the ink, irrigation, gunpowder, the clock, India invented the number zero. So all of these inventions 5,000 years ago, in fact, before, uh, up to, until like 500 years ago, Asia actually was, especially the Dark Ages, Asia was exceeded what they were doing in, in Europe. And so what happened? Now what happened was that uh, the West from the Industrial Revolution developed uh, in, in uh, England and uh, which also came from the, the questions that they were asking were different. You know, people from Europe were going to picking up slaves in Africa, discovering the United States, you know, developing this trade. Uh, labor costs went up, which was the fuel for the Industrial Revolution, which created the weapons that they've developed. And what happened in Asia 300 years ago is that the West started colonizing Africa and then eventually Asia. And initially, it was a physical coloniz colonization. And today, it's a psychological one, right? So women with Louis Vuitton handbags, <laughs> actually, uh, 
And so, it's, it, it, so that's one of the explanations for it. The second is the framing of what reality is. You know, what is reality? The Western framing of reality is that this is me, this is not me, I'm gonna go explore, conquer, discover, and then God or someone will judge me later on. So there's a material basis for reality, and the hero's journey is a physical journey that you take. And if you look at who the heroes are, like Napoleon or Steve Jobs, they're going out to, to conquer the world. The Eastern framing is that this is me, but I'm part of this. And I can't explain who I am without explaining what this is. And so if you look at the journey there, it's an inner journey. And if you look at the heroes of the Buddha or Gandhi, it's a spiritual or it's an inner basis for reality, and the journey is an inner journey. Very big difference, and arguably because of the West and the materialism and the consumer society today, we're, you know, that has created arguably some of the problems that we have, that we face. Related to this too, in terms of the East and West, is the term right-hand path and left-hand path. Have any of you heard of the right-hand path or the left-hand path? In society, there are certain rules that are set to have society function. The school, any organization, have their rules, their conventional practices, and what happens is there are mythologies that are right-hand path mythologies where you follow the rules, you do well, you excel, you get good grades, you innovate, others like you, you become the team captain, you know, prom queen, etc., and then you do well. And for me, uh, being in academia, you graduate, you get a bachelor's, you get a master's, you get a PhD, you keep writing, and you keep climbing the ladder, and you get rewarded, and if you fall, there are mythologies around that to rehab rehabilitate you. That's the right-hand path. I follow the orthodoxy, I make the organizational stronger, I base my decisions on principles and everything that are well, well adopted and understood in society, in the culture of the society. The left-hand path, there are people that just say, to hell with this, I reject all of this, I'm gonna go do my own thing, I'm gonna follow my bliss, I'm going to go on a hero's journey, I'm gonna throw all the rules away, and I'm just gonna find my own way. And any true artist, any true scientist, any true entrepreneur has to look at the current way things are doing, the current way that people are thinking, and the current systems, and they have to go out into the unknown rediscover the fire, discover something new, and then bring it back to society. That's the hero's journey. That's the tale of Prometheus. And, um, and there, there's a whole there are whole mythologies around that. And there's the monomyth. Those of you that are interested in this, Joseph Campbell has written quite a lot about this. Now the situation is our education system, <laughs> especially here at DBS, <laughs> is largely <laughs> even more so at LaSalle, <laughs> is a right-hand path convention, you know, jump through these hoops to prove that you're good, right? And so the challenge that we have in education today, especially if we're looking to train innovators, is how do we get them to innovate when our whole education system is based upon this kind of fear. You know, my wife and I, my wife is in the front row, you know, they go to Kumon, you know, there are these exams over and over again after certain exams, more exams. And so the challenge is how do we nurture students and help them as we've been hearing from all of the previous speakers before, how do we help them find their purpose? You know, so when uh, Joyce spoke, she went and she did investment risk management for a while and she did that, until, is she still here? Until, uh, probably until she said, hey, you know, I can't do this anymore, right? <laughs> and then I just really wanna find something more meaningful, arguably. Yeah, she's nodding her head. And so she went through this, went through 10 years, was it, of the career, before she kind of staked out on her own. And so the question is how, and you know, him, and then um, uh, the, the other speaker with the, uh, 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 what was the name, Lawrence? No, sorry? 
Yeah, Harrison, for example, had a situation and was thrust into this. He found his purpose because of, of personal things that have happened to him too. And, you know, it wasn't an easy childhood as we heard. Um, but the thing is, how do we help people find their mission and their purpose versus having them jump through these hoops of, you guys probably know math, English, and Chinese. You know, your whole self-worth is how you do in math, English, and Chinese, and how you rank. And so they're good at thinking, but what about feeling? What about emotional intelligence and somatic awareness, which are arguably even more skills that correlate to success in the future? And so all of us were born with instinct. In education in school, we developed the intellect but what truly makes you successful, arguably speaking, is, they talk about synchronicity, emotional intelligence and spiritual intelligence to cultivate intuition and insight. Follow that inner compass. How do we help people get to that? Now, traditional education is very good at getting you from instinct to intellect. Hell, they'll beat it out of you, they'll give you the grades, etc. But then how do we get from intellect to intuition, which is a completely different form of knowing. You know, when I got married, I wrote my wife a song that starts out with, when I first laid eyes on you, I already knew that you were my destiny. How do you know something like that? If you ask anyone that's happily married, how do you know she was the one or he was the one, right? Anyone that's been successful in their career, everyone said, go this way, but something told me, go this way, right? How do you filter out the noise and find that deep truth within you? Whether it's my daughter and dancing and art, how do you find this? And so this is a challenge. My son, I'll just be honest with you. My son got a poor grade in conduct. <laughs> And we're concerned about that. And he, if you know him, he's a student in uh, ninth grade, and he's, um, you know, he's a little different, right? He likes to joke, he likes to prank, and he doesn't fit in. He doesn't like jumping through the hoops. He's more arguably left-hand path than right-hand path. And part of the reason I showed this picture is he's discovered, although his, his uh, grades aren't as good as we'd like, <laughs> he can solve a Rubik's Cube very, very quickly, and he's an amazing magician. If any of you have seen him do a magic trick, amazing. And so how do we help people that may not fit in the, the current structure of things and help them find their purpose? And how do we support that? And how do we inspire them from action, to, for action from joy, wonder, and compassion rather than fear, need, and desire? And so we're part of a family here and there's a relationship between the teachers. The teachers clearly want the students to do well, right? Those teachers out here, yeah? As parents, we want our students, our kids to do well. And how does yelling, spanking, giving, warning them with great, you know, how does inciting fear, need, and desire, panic monkey, as we saw in the video as well too, how do we help them find their purpose when their autonomic nervous system is always on panic mode, in, in, in high gear? And what happens with this, and the opportunities here with this, are the Eastern approaches. How do we find inner happiness and live from that? Not only for the students, but for the parents and for the teachers. So a lot of things like meditation, perhaps we can bring more of this kind of practice into schools. Help people reconnect thoughts and integrate their thoughts in their bodies. Understanding the mind-body relationship. And so if we know now with advancements in neuroscience, we know the stress response, we know the sympathetic versus sympathetic. With things like the Apple smart, uh, smart watches, with heart rate monitors, we can actually literally measure that in real time. So how do we bring these in to help 
get out of this fear desire mode and work as a collective, parents, teachers, with their students, to help them find their mission and their purpose and explore it. Like even, I think Michael said, when you graduate, go off and do things for five years and just explore. Because ultimately, to be able to climb high requires deep roots. And so the inner stillness and integration into your feelings and and awareness of that is necessary for you to succeed and to climb higher. If I climb high without the roots, if I'm not stable, that's what leads to kind of addiction and a lot of destructive emotion, which is a lot of what arguably we're seeing in the American politics today. Actually, in Hong Kong politics too, <laughs> but uh, he's, he's not here anymore, right? <laughs> and so again, how do we build the groups and how do we come together to solve the problems? And as Michael also mentioned, the true role of education isn't so that you can get a good job, isn't so that you're really good at English and math, it's to help you understand Who are you? And why are you here? And in relation to this. And for that, for me, you know, it's pretty simple. I have my family that I care a lot about. I do research in consciousness. I'm involved in entrepreneurship. I do music. I do events like TEDx Hong Kong. And I advocate healthy living, although my wife doesn't think I sleep enough. (laughs) And I teach at PolyU. And so what are the stories that are driving each of you, not only the students, but also the parents. As we grow, the situation, you know, without addressing this, the situation exacerbates. Um, A few weeks ago, I saw my dad. My dad is 87. I'm actually the sixth generation of professors in my family. My dad, this is in front of his office. He still goes to the office every day, and he plays Go. My situation is this year I turned 54. And in Hong Kong, as an academic, even though you're tenured, they have a mandatory retirement age of 60. Which means I only have six years of professional career left. And I'm married and I have kids. If you could only solve one problem in the world and you only had six years left, what problem would you try to solve? This is kind of the end game dilemma that I'm moving towards now. When you go to TED, when you see Al Gore, who do you, what do you think of when you think of Al Gore? Global warming, right? You know, Al Gore is all in on global warming. That's the problem he's trying to solve. If you talk to Bill Gates, malaria, right? Or whatever the big foundation focus is. There's top scientists that I just know spider webs really well. So if you could go all in on one thing, this is kind of a poker term, what would it be? Given the situation of the world today and you have a family, You know, we're here, nice, this is one of the top schools in Hong Kong. Michael already said he felt sympathy about English language. His, seems like his mission now is English language for Hong Kong um, disadvantaged kids. But if you look worldwide, there are all of these massive problems that we have. We cannot do things business as usual anymore. If we continue propagating the same ideas and the same stories, my kids, You, the youth here, you know, right now, you know, this is a first world problem, but my wife introduced me to uh, wild tuna belly toro. Have you ever had wild tuna belly toro sashimi? It's amazing, but you know what the problem is? You can't get it anymore because it's all fished out. Right? And so if you look at the plastic in the ocean, if you look at the pollution in China, the deforestation, this is the plastic in the ocean, haves, have not, terrorism, right? All of these problems in the world today. What's it going to be like for their kids and their kids? 
and given for me six years left. Now, in terms of propagating the ideas, this is a, a, there's a book called The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. I actually gave a talk at Deepak Chopra's conference on, you know, can your baby be your guru? You know, so how do, kind of parenting as a spiritual path. But here, you may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backwards, nor tarries with yesterday. What is this vision? What is this future? And how do we align our youth to be able to find that, discover it, and then work towards making that happen? How do we get them to get their, find, first have dreams, and then make those dreams come true? Work towards making those dreams to come true. And so related to this is, you know, what are we living, willing to die for? You know, for the parents that are here. What are you, you know, there's a lot to be willing to live for, but have you thought of what are you willing to die for? And so for me, you know, my wife kind of complains, I'm traveling a lot, trying to evan evangelize. My daughter can actually give parts of my speech now and everything. It's like, do you, why do you go off and do all of this? But the way I see myself right now, with six years left, is I'm a salmon swimming back upstream. I know I only, my time is limited. And my, my daughter even said, you know, Daddy, 30, 40 years from now, you'll be dead. <laughs> right? And I know that too. So for me, it's a salmon swimming back upstream. And for most of you, especially the students, you're kind of going the other way. You know, I've swum out in the ocean. I've met my wife. I have a beautiful family. Really blessed. I feel very blessed. And I feel very grateful, you know, again, getting back to family, to being able to have a wife to take care of the family and to have the environment that allows me to... I'm, those of you that know me, I'm kind of one of these left-hand path guys as well, too. Is to provide the solid base for me to do my work. And that's something I'm very grateful for. And that work that I'm working on is really looking at how do we use media interactive media biofeedback and intersubjective experiences to facilitate personal transformation and induce awakening. Can we understand the mind-body relationship so that everyone can act, everyone can learn to live from the innate joy of being? <laughs> I don't need this. Rather than the fears, needs, and desires driven by the stories that have been programmed into them. And arguably, if you can get everyone on the planet to act from the innate joy of being, rather than the fears, needs, and desires driven by the stories, and if you can, through now digital technology, which almost exclusively influences the mind, and if you can do that on a global scale, world peace. And most, most of the other problems of the world today, war, famine, Lack, hunger, most of those other problems will go away. Thank you.